Hey there, it's Dan Kenner with another episode of The Casual Author. Today is Tuesday, May 30th, 2023, as I record this, and this is episode number 78 of the podcast. Today, we're talking to Frankie Baghdad about her first book, I Love My Kids, But I Don't Always Like Them, as well as writing with ADHD, what that process looks like, some of the challenges, and how she overcomes that. So really interesting conversation. I hope you stick around for that. Of course, we're going to go ahead and start with updates. First off, you may have noticed that I did not have an episode last week. Uh, primarily, that was because of the plague that struck the Kenner home. It was uh, pretty horrible. <laughs> if you were following my email list, you have gotten an email where I talked a little bit about it. Um, or if you followed me on social media, TikTok, then you would have seen a video update of that. If not... Essentially, everyone in my family got sick at the same time, except for myself. So my son got it on the Friday before last Sunday, and he threw up, you know, four or five times. It was not great, but it was definitely not enjoyable, or it was definitely not terrible, I meant to see, say. Uh, but then everybody else got sick following that the day after, except for myself. So six of my family members, that is including the baby, got raging sick, and they were all throwing up on and off for about 12, 15 hours. I was the only one not throwing up, so you can imagine I was running around like crazy, um, cleaning up throw-up buckets, and you know it was near 60 throw-up buckets that I cleaned up over the course of that time, and then naturally I got sick the day after. Now, I didn't have the same type of sickness. I think it just affected me a little bit different, so I was pretty down and out for the beginning of last week. Um, I was feeling a little bit better by the time I might have recorded this podcast episode, but I was still pretty exhausted, so I figured, you know what, let's just not, and that's why we are here today. But that's all right, we <laughs> you take things as they come, that is the nature of being casual, uh, that is the nature of life as an author with a lot of things going on, so it is what it is, and you know, I don't regret it. Regardless, here we are, and some updates. So in terms of Dragonblooded, um, I feel like I'm a broken record, I am so close, I really am very close to finishing it. Um, it's at about 106,000 words right now, which, you know, in hindsight, isn't as bad as it could have been. I know I was targeting 90 ish thousand words, definitely did not hit that, but it is a lot better than the Light Bear Chronicles books, which the targets were, you know, roughly 110 to 120,000 words, and they were upwards of 25, 30, 60,000 words more than the target. So we're definitely not in that boat. I really am close to wrapping it up. Um, I believe I'm on the last chapter. I do feel like I'm on the last chapter. As a panther, it's hard to say. I feel like I'm just wrapping up a lot of the emotions, a lot of the, the things that happened, tying some knots together in preparation for the next book. It's not really going to end on a cliffhanger as much as, I mean, it's not so much a cliffhanger. There's There's some resolutions, but I think there's a lot left that will interest people in the next book. So as a reminder, Dragon Blood, it is the first of a six book series. Not sure why I did that to myself, but that's okay. Um, the Cyber City book has still kind of put, it's been put on a hold. Uh, my co-author is still working on some family things, but she'll get back to it soon. And then we can continue writing that. Um, other than that, in author news, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of updates. Most of it has just been writing, continuing to write, continuing to write, and playing around, around with some mid-journey image generations and, you know, dabbling with social media. I feel like uh, a lot of it really comes down to the writing right now until I get back into the editing phase. So editing is definitely not my favorite part of the writing, but, you know, you do what you got to do. Now, in terms of homesteading, uh, the chickens have moved out to their new tractor. I think I've talked a little bit about that. This one has wheels, so it's a little bit easier to move around. Very grateful for that. But they <laughs> we have run into a problem with them eating the eggs. So if any of you know if you have chickens, when the when the chickens start eating the eggs, it becomes a problem, right? There's not so much you can do to train it out of them. And so what I think is happening is in their tractor, they they like to kind of kick the bedding out of the nesting boxes that they have. And so when they do that, they lay an egg and then it'll break. And so I think they see that it's broken and then they they peck at it and they eat it. So that's a little bit tricky because we've only been getting, you know, a couple of eggs every day when we're used to this six, seven, 10, 11 egg type day. And we haven't had a lot of eggs. We, we eat a lot of eggs. So we've had to play around with that. I put more bedding in there. We kind of closed off the nesting box area with some curtains to darken it up, kind of prevent them from poking around and just playing in there. It's helped a little bit. We, we managed to um, get seven or eight eggs for the past couple of days. So that's good. But 
it's definitely not where we want it to be. Um, and hopefully they stop eating them. That's <laughs> if you've got any tips on making sure chickens don't eat eggs, just want to let me know. But our chickens did hatch. So I told you about three weeks ago, a little bit more than three weeks ago, we put our eggs in the incubator and they have hatched. So our, our hatch rate wasn't as high as we hoped. I think we got 10 chicks that hatched. Um, we put 22 eggs in. There were a bunch that weren't fertilized and there were a bunch that just did not develop. And you have three or four. Regardless, um, the chicks are, are hatched and they're out there just living it up in their little brooder area and more we'll be raising them and seeing how they do we did end up purchasing more meat chickens from a hatchery mainly because we're learning that this breed isn't as good as we hoped we were kind of going for a mixed breed where they're bigger birds so they can be good for meat but they also have pretty good egg production so the problem with the middle ground is you're never gonna get the best of both worlds right if you either get a meat chicken they're gonna be really good they're gonna be meaty they're gonna be um easy to raise um, versus the egg layers are usually pretty skinny. They're slim, but they just lay tons of eggs. The problem is we're kind of in the metal grain, so we're not getting a lot of eggs, and they're not the biggest chickens for me. So we hope that doing this hybrid approach would allow us to hatch our own eggs each year so that we could account for our meat production needs as well as for our egg production needs, and we're finding that's not quite what we need. So We'll see what we do from here. We may introduce some new breeds to the flock, see if we can cross some breeds, if they can, uh, you know, once the roosters mate with some of these other breeds, if we can kind of spur some better egg production in the future generation of chickens. I don't know. It's all fun. We're dabbling in it. It's a fun experience. We're not too discouraged by it. It's just, you know, you learn one thing, you learn what doesn't work, and you try something new. So that's how things are. Other than that, we have been out in the garden all the time. We spent all day there out there on Monday for Memorial Day, as well as on Friday, just outside planting, 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 dealing with the weeds, getting the yard up to snuff. And it's been great. We're hoping that we have more success with growing this year. Historically, we haven't had great success. So we're hoping with all the time and effort we're putting into making the garden a better place, uh, making it more healthy and uh, thriving space for the plants that they'll do better this year. And of course, we might be disappointed. I mean, it is what it is, but we're doing everything that we can on our front. So I believe that's it for Homestead updates. We can go ahead and shift over to the interview portion of the podcast. How are you doing today, Frankie? Good, good. How are you? Doing well. We were just talking previously about how chaotic Mondays are, so... Mm -hmm. Here we are on this chaotic Monday, uh, but yeah. I'm excited to talk to you uh, for a number of reasons. I feel like there's a lot of things that I can relate to you on. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about your book, kind of your experience getting into that book. Um, before we get into that, how long have you been writing? What what had got you into writing this book? Where did you get your inspiration and whatnot? So how long have I been writing? That's an interesting question. I, I've been like writing in the middle of the night for many years. Um, I actually, when I decided to start my own business and was going through sort of like a big personal evolution in 2019, I realized I had started like 12 blogs, um, <laughs> which really, you know, fits in so well with my ADHD brain. Um, and I started then like an actual blog that matched my business and all of that good stuff. But you know, one day, it just occurred to me that I had more to say on the subject of parenting, and it wasn't going to cut it on the blog, I, mm. I needed sort of like a different format. Um, but I'll say I didn't really see myself as a writer or someone who become a published author until very recently. Um, you know, growing up as a kid in the 80s who couldn't spell, it never occurred to me that I could be a professional writer because I couldn't spell. I still really can't use a comma correctly to save my life. Um, and it's just so much less important now. There's so many great tools I can really accommodate myself with technology. And I've learned what I can do well and what I can't. And I have a team of editors. I just know I need help in certain areas. So that really opened up doors for me that I didn't anticipate in the 80s and 90s. Um, so it all happened quickly. I like all of a sudden saw myself as a writer. And then I was like, you know, I'll try to write a book and see what happens. <laughs> 
And here and we here, are. Here you are, right? It's yeah. done. So, I mean, I had a, a similar experience other than I didn't necessarily have problems with spelling as much as I, I have never thought that I had enough, a big enough vocabulary to write. You know, I've always read a lot, a lot. And every time I read, I was like, this is beautiful prose. I can't write that. Right? There's no way. I'm just not capable of that. Anyway, that's, we're not here to talk about me. I do want to go ahead and put a plug in for commas. I hate commas. You know, <laughs> it's, I, it's not I, just you. Yes, I, yes. I can't figure I, them out. I can't. So, you know, it's like a running joke between me and um, that my editor who does like does all my blogs. She's helped me with some more formal projects too. I mean, I just, you know, I can't. <laughs> can't it's do like, it correctly. And everyone's like, just memorize the rules. It's not a big deal. I feel like there are no rules. I mean, there are. I get that there are. Some people are good at them. But for me, it's just like, I don't get them. <laughs> Yeah, I don't either. So very, don't very... feel bad about that. Editors are amazing. That's a, I've had plenty of conversations with editors and love them. Yeah, yeah. That's a great skill set. <laughs> Definitely a great yeah. skill set. One that I don't have. But so your book. So your book is called I Love My Kids, But I Don't Always Like Them. So um, I, I, I would, we'll talk about a little bit of the book, kind of a, getting into the writing process and whatnot. But for you, why this book? I mean, why you talked about you couldn't put everything you wanted to on your blog, but why specifically this type of parenting book? You know, parenting is hard. And I think parents walk around with a lot of shame surrounding that. I know I certainly have. And I think um, I foolishly was holding myself to even higher standards with an education background and now more recently a social work background like that should mean I should be perfect with my kids like that's ridiculous. Um, so I, as I started to accept that with myself, it's really important to me to give parents that opportunity to accept that we're not going to be perfect. And you're going to have a moment where you're like, oh my God, these kids, what do I do? Uh, and more than one moment, right? Um, so I figure if I can be open about how challenging it is, it really gives you know, others permission. I also realized um, that some of the things I was doing were really working in my house. I, I'm really lucky because I've worked with kids for, you know, over two decades. Mm -hmm. So that worked when I was a classroom teacher, or when I was working with camps or as a teacher consultant, I could sort of bring them in my little lab school at home and figure out how to make them work for my three kids who are so, so different and have very, very different needs. And I wanted to share, you know, if I can help anyone make parenting easier, I, I feel good about that. <laughs> So that's really the, you know, motivation behind that book. Well, and I, I, I definitely want to agree with you on the parenting thing. There's a lot of people that um, th they feel like if they mention anything about how challenging it is, then they're going to be judged or looked down on or thought, you know, you're a bad parent or whatever. But then I feel there's a group of parents that just kind of learn to laugh about certain situations. Like, you know, if maybe a couple of weeks down the line after an unfortunate series of events, you can laugh about it. Be like, okay, that was actually a little bit funny. The chaos of whatever the situation was or the tantrum or just like, and then, you know, if, you, if it becomes a shared experience among parents, which I think is where a lot of us should meet. Um, yeah. those of you listening, if you know, I have six kids now, I know in my intro, I say five kids. I do, I do need to fix that still. It's yeah. our sixth one was born about six, four months ago. Um, but for you, so if you could break down, I mean, obviously don't give away all the secrets of your books, but <laughs> if you could break down kind of some of the major points or things that really stuck out for you as you were writing it in terms of here, here's how you should approach parenting, or here's a perspective that maybe will aid you with your parenting. Yeah, absolutely. And um, really, I teach this concept to educators and professionals as well as parents is this idea of right sizing our expectations. So, you know, I have three kids. My first child was relatively, um, I don't know, it, no one's easy, right? But we would call her like an easy baby, an easy toddler, like rule follower. And my second child was different. And it was a shock to me that I had to like start over again, right? By the time I had number three, I, I know you get, it. I was like, okay, like I won't know anything again. I was prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized as soon as I could really let go of that, like not just saying it, but really living it and get to know my kids as individuals, 
um, it really opened up a whole new world for me. And I was able to then plan ahead. Because I always say, like, in terms of behavior, right, we think about like, kids having tantrums or meltdowns, or just like not wanting to follow our directions. The best way to handle all of those things is to try to prevent them. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. yeah, making sure our kids are getting what they need. Mm -hmm. So by really knowing who each of your kids are, um, you're in a better place to do that. And that means veering off a little bit from the more standard, like, okay, six-year-olds do A, B, and C. Okay, like, that's a great place to start. But who is my six-year-old and what do they need? Um, maybe they have a disability and then I know a little bit more about their unique needs. Or maybe they're just you know, an individual and they're a little behind in an area, but really excel in another one. So knowing that is so important. And that's really where I start the book. Um, another principle that I really weave throughout the book is collaborating with our kids when things aren't going well, instead of just, you know, dictating, okay, this is what we're doing now. We're changing everything up. And here are the new rules, like sitting them down and saying, okay, like we're all yelling at each other. This can't be any fun for you. It's no fun for me. This is not what I want. What do you think we can do differently and working with them to make things, you know, more harmonious at home? Absolutely. So I, I totally agree with all things and getting to know your kids can be such an interesting process, particularly when they're younger. So my kids are still pretty young. Um, my oldest is only eight, he turns nine this year, and then we've got five after that. But um, there's still a lot to learn. And my wife and I were having a conversation recently about, you know, what we know about each of the kids and kind of their quote unquote love languages, how they respond to mm -hmm. feedback, kind of, because they're all very different. And it's mm -hmm. amazing. It's great how unique they are. It just provides some interesting challenges because it's not as easy as just like collective parenting, one yeah. fit, one size fits all type situation because it doesn't. Um, but uh, my parents were laughing at me the other day because we went out to dinner with them. And I said, pause, I have to strategically place these six children so they don't fight with each other. Because you know who butts heads with who. And so I strategically placed them and there was not fighting the entire dinner, be only because of the placement. <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything other than that. Just well, keeping right. certain kids away from other kids. But you know, it's an example of what you said, you know, you learn your who they are, you know, kind of what they struggle with and how to help them in those areas. Um, so is your book, I'm just curious because I, I unfortunately haven't had a chance to read your book yet, but do you infuse your book with like experiences from your own life, from other people's life? How did you decide what to put in versus what not to? Yeah. So I tell tons of stories in my book. Um, I really see myself as a storyteller first, like the mm -hmm. writing next, but always, you know, as a teacher, I was always telling stories mm -hmm. to, you know, to help teach a concept. Um, so there are lots of stories from my own parenting and my children. Um, I promise they've all been approved. People always ask me nothing in there they wouldn't want, especially now I have two teenagers. So mm -hmm. I, I'm realizing how important that is and really thankful I did that. <laughs> um, and you know, all of these kids I've worked with throughout the years in various settings. So what I've done really is taken those experiences. I've changed the names and genders and all kinds of things, of course, to protect confidentiality. And even sometimes have taken two kids and mushed their stories together because, mm -hmm. you know, that works. So there are these little fables in there to really help um, illustrate how these concepts would actually work in the household. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think so what you highlighted, I appreciate that you said you're a storyteller first. I think that's what makes a lot of nonfiction books stand out over other nonfiction books, right? Because I don't know if you if you're like me, if you've read nonfiction books that are just kind of dry, right? Sure. They're just yeah. lots of bullet points and lots of great mm -hmm. points, amazing points, but there's just not a lot of connectivity to everything. When the person, the author like yourself, adds those personal stories, those experiences, it just brings it to a whole new light. And suddenly it's not just a bullet point nonfiction book. It is now a, you know, a living story and you can experience it. So I'm curious to know, did you have, ex I mean, you had experience writing blogs, but you hadn't published a book. So did you do extensive research about how to format your nonfiction book? Or did you just kind of figure, I'll figure it out as I go. And you just kind of put it together. Yeah, sometimes I'm a bit like brave and we'll just jump into things. Other times I'll like overthink it to death. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I I Googled, honestly, like what does a nonfiction book proposal look like? Um, and then 
one thing I learned when I went into business on my own and, you know, this all started with like a layoff in 2019 and I needed to reinvent myself is um, I really relied on my network and my community. Mm, so sure. I knew somebody who was in publishing and like in a totally different area and I reached out to him, he was awesome. And he's like, you know what? Um, I have this literary agent that I sometimes send friends to, you know, who write nonfiction. So I got super lucky. I got connected with her. She had more of, um, oh, I can't remember the official term. Maybe you'll know, like a process editor, not just proofreading, but someone who could really help me refine the structure mm -hmm. that she suggested who I worked with, um, who really taught me how to like, you know, make each chapter flow similarly like that again like that was all part of like my creative writing issue in third grade like that I don't get so well mm -hmm. so he helped it make it really readable I think I'm um, then digestible um and you know I just went from there but it, yeah I didn't really overthink it I just went for it and I figured well I mean if it doesn't get published, okay. <laughs> like I'll, I'll, I'll put chapters on my blog. It's like, we have so many different avenues these days to share that I knew I would share the stories somehow. Um, but I, I got very lucky to be connected with really good people on the field. Well, and I think you've, you've highlighted a couple of really important things. I think a lot of people forget about is that being an author doesn't have to be a, a you only type experience. It shouldn't be right. I think a lot of authors feel lonely because they're like, well, I don't, I don't know what to do, or I don't know. You can find those resources. You can, there's tons of people. A lot of people leverage connections via social media, Twitter, you know, and whatnot, all these various places where they meet other authors or people, editors and whatnot. Um, you don't have to feel alone and you shouldn't be alone in putting this together because you need beta readers. You need, you know, often in fiction, we call them developmental editors. I think it's kind of similar to what you explained about like the structure and format. Um, yeah. And th those can be very key. The other thing that you mentioned was not being afraid to just do it. <laughs> I think right. the, the overthinking thing is so hard. There's so many authors out there that say, I've been writing this book for 10 years, for 15 years. And the question is just why? Right. Like, right. You, you, you do something about it. Right. And I think it's hard for some people to swallow, but there's a uh, way that people can't overthink things. Um, admittedly, books aren't going to be 100 percent perfect, but they'll get to that point where they're publishable and they've got they're structured in a very good way and people can enjoy them. And it seems like people are enjoying your book. I, I've gotten some great feedback. Yeah. And, you know, I think in a parallel place, I was going through this process of starting my own business and realizing that like, I was going to hit a certain niche of clients, and that I wasn't going to please everyone. Mm -hmm. Like I, my services weren't going to be the right fit for everyone. So it was easy in that mindset to realize I wasn't writing this book for every parent, you know, on earth, it was a certain parent who had a sense of humor, <laughs> who liked this casual format. And I knew those parents were there. Um, while there were plenty of other parents who felt like their needs were already being met with more formal types of um, parenting guides. And there are a lot of great ones out there. Yeah, absolutely. There definitely are lots of resources. But I mean, I think that's great. I think this is a digital age where there's lots of information and everybody can benefit from that. But I I also appreciate that you said it's not, it may not be everybody's cup of tea and you accept that. Yeah. I mean, and that, that was, a, that. I've gotten much better at just knowing that. Well, I, you learn all over time, all authors. I feel like you have to, there's a lot of things that you learn. Um, so I published five books now and I've definitely learned a lot from that experience. Um, your writing gets better, the, your organizing gets better. But I am curious from someone <laughs> someone with ADHD to another person with ADHD, I'm curious to know, what was your experience like when writing this book? Like, How did you keep things organized? How did you, what did you use to keep your thoughts in order as you were putting it together? Yes. So, you know, I've really, <laughs> yeah, I was able to harness a lot of my ADHD traits for good. Like we talk sure. about just thinking and doing that, that was like a positive uh, side effect of impulse, right? Like, sometimes I'm good at just like, it feels good right now. And I'm going to try it, right? Mm -hmm. This was not a dangerous thing. Thank goodness. Um, and that's how I got started in terms of, you know, staying focused, like that was tough. Um, and I sometimes get like, 
stuck in an ADHD and I think like artist place where like I have to really feel motivated and feel it or like nothing like nothing comes out of my mind I can't write at all so that was tricky I didn't like love writing on deadline um but I got there um yeah and I I really learned to like stop beating myself up for my maybe like unconventional ways of getting work done. You know, like if you, there's a lot of really good blogs out there by writers on how to write. And they talk about like taking two hours, like twice a week for writing or like organizing it in beautiful ways, none of which were going to work for me. Um, and the plus side is that I know when I get motivated, like I can black out the whole world and write more than like most humans in two hours. So because I trusted that process, I think I was able to work with myself um, in that way. Now, did I have moments where like I couldn't remember which was the um, most updated copy like that I saved and all of those things? I did. Um, I took some advice from people who also struggle with organization and how to organize, I find that's better for me. So um, my husband, well, not like someone with ADHD, but also struggles with some executive functioning. He said, you know, every time like your editor sends you a copy back, he's like, date it. So you know, like which one is the most recent. He's like, and don't erase any of them till the end. I thought he was being a little crazy, but that worked really well. So, you know, I, I was very open to advice and tried to remember that I, that I needed it and I didn't know what I was doing and to try um, some things that worked for other people. And I think that served me well. The whole dating thing. Yeah, I learned that the hard way. Definitely not. Right. In, I mean, it seems logical. Like it's like the, the smart thing to do. But it's one of those things just like, I don't feel like I have time for this mentally. And so, yeah, yeah, now I'm still just like rummaging through different versions of my first book. It's just like, okay, well, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's a little bit of a pain. But I want to highlight a couple of things because one thing as as, as a person with ADHD, who's also a pantser, so discovery writer, however you want to put it, um, Mm -hmm. I don't pre-plot or plan any of my books. My brain can't handle it. I can't handle it. And honestly, I just don't want to, frankly, it's just my personality. But there's a lot of advice around writing out there that is prescriptive. It's very plot heavy. It's very, you need to pre-plan everything and it just doesn't work for me. And so I don't read a lot of writer advice books and it's not because I don't think they're good. I think they can work for a lot of people, but for me, they just frustrate me. So, you know, all these people saying like, if you want to improve your writing, try X book or try X book or try this book. It's like, no, I'm, those don't work for me, right? But I think that that's the point of it. If it doesn't work for you, you're not a bad writer. You're not a bad person. It's okay. Right. You learn. You're like, I know myself. Like I knew I knew it wouldn't work and I trusted myself. And here you are. Right. And it's the same with me. I just trusted my process. I know it works for me. And like you, I can sit down in, you know, 45 minute period and write about 2000 words. Um, Mm -hmm. It's it because I just know how to get that focus. I know how to trust my process and it comes out. Right. So I just mean, those of you listening, don't feel pressure to write a specific way, definitely give it a try. I mean, if you're open to giving things a try, but don't be frustrated if something doesn't work. And, you know, for people listening for you as well, one book that definitely I really connected with was, it was called, uh, I think, Dear Writer, Are You Intuitive? It's a writing book and it's based on intuition. So it's purely intuitive writing. And it just, it totally resounded with me because I'm an intuitive person. I'm an intuitive author. So it was very much like, trust your intuition. You have this unknown unconscious experience from constantly intaking not uh, tons of nonfiction books or tons of fiction books and so you know how to do these things you just don't need someone to tell you how to do it you just trust yourself anyway it's very good i recommend it uh, cool Excellent book but okay so for you once <laughs> once you determine to write a book right like, all right mm-hmm. I, i'm gonna put this in book form and you right. you started to format it and everything um who did you work with to make sure that like the information was relevant or did you just trust your editors? Like who, who did you work with most in that process? You know, that's, so I'm in the process of um, writing my second book and that's really something that I'm changing up a bit this time. So 
Um, because I publish conventionally, I needed a, you know, nonfiction book proposal. So I don't like outlining either. Like to me, it takes me back to like the middle school research projects. Mm -hmm. I like, mm -hmm. yeah, I just like, <laughs> it feels so stressful. However, one thing I needed to do was have like my chapters, um, and like a three sentence description. So it did force me to outline a little bit, but what was, I guess my, um, what was nice about it is I knew that I still had some permission to deviate from the proposal a bit. Sure, yeah. So I re that relaxed me. Um, and it did kind of, it, it, it let me look at it holistically and see like where I was headed. Mm -hmm. Um, something I did after the book was published is, you know, connect with people in my field and give out like a bunch of preview copies. Um, I get a lot of feedback and it was great for all kinds of things. And some of them did it, were nice enough to um, publish on social media and all, all these things. And I really would like to do that in the pre-publishing process the next time around because it was so um, meaningful to me. And I've just realized like this book came out in 2021, like I could write a second edition already, like so much changes in the field of parenting, so much has changed with my own parenting. Um, you know, it's just it happens quickly. So I, I would really like to, you know, have some, I don't know, uh, feedback earlier in the process this time. You know, the person I, who was editing for me had written in the genre and that helped a lot. Um yeah, but you know, a lot of it again, I was like just trusting instinct. I really felt like I was writing the book I couldn't find. And I'm that sure. yeah. kept me, you know, like grounded. Mm -hmm. Um, because once you get past babies and toddlers, like everything is about like, you know, gentle parenting or um authoritative parenting. It's all like really prescriptive. Or it's about like, you know, you have a child with Down syndrome or a child with autism. But there wasn't anything to me that was like, what do I do? Like how do I approach just, you know, raising humans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how do I think about each of them? What do I do when they all need different things? So um really being able to write that book that I wish I had, that definitely kept me really focused on what my mission was. And I think that's a really important thing to think about because now I haven't written nonfiction. I don't have any experience with that. I would like to write nonfiction, but I'm not there yet. I, right. I'm not brave enough to do it yet. <laughs> but I think okay. fiction seems so scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny to talk to people because yeah, they're all just flip flops. They're like, I don't think I could write. Like, oh, I can, I can write a big, epic fantasy series. I've done it. It's not challenging for me. But yeah, nonfiction. It's just one of those things where I feel so, so organized, and I'm just not organized. Yeah, you know, I'm. It's it's tricky for me to wrap my wrap my mind around formatting something yeah, so that it's. Yeah understandable by someone else but i want to highlight the point that you said you're writing the book that you feel like you couldn't find and and i think that should be the driving point for a lot of authors there's so many people i've talked to when i tell them i'm an author they're like oh, i would love to write a book you know i've got these story ideas but i'm just not gonna do it and it's just like well why not like well i couldn't find that book anywhere else or i can't find so in my case um you can find books like this but i i appreciate um clean um, fiction, clean fantasy stories. And mine mm -hmm. are geared. I've got some stories for kids. I've got some stories for adults, but they're always appropriate. There's nothing going to be, there's no sexually explicit stuff. There's no language. And that's because that feels like that stuff I'm struggling to find. That's what I like to read. So I'm like, well, I'll just write some, right? So that other people like me seeking these books can also find these. But I think that's good. You know, if you have that experience, leverage that, use that as a springboard into your motivation and get that story, right? That book that you can't find. So I love that piece of advice. I think it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the other, I, I mean, I definitely had all kinds of people who inspired me while I wrote it. I happened to also be in school because my pandemic purchase was um, going back to school to get my social work to <laughs> um, You know, I should have just bought shoes, but somehow that's what I ended up doing. Um, <laughs> so I was doing that alongside like the like thousands of edits of this book and actually getting it out there. So actually, um, I was reading a lot of textbooks. So I was reading a lot of dry nonfiction and some really, you know, clever nonfiction and whatnot and informational text. Mm -hmm. um, so like something I, I really wanted in the book was like bullet points at the end of each chapter. Mm -hmm. um, 
because that like saved my life in reading so much like the volume you have to read in grad school is just crazy so like that I put in there um and like the stories I put those in there because I need those stories to learn so the fact that I have this background in education and I've been studying and speaking on how people learn for so many years I, I think that's what lends itself so well to writing nonfiction because I, I wanted it to be meaningful. I wanted people to walk away with like something they could try the next day instead of, you know, lots of jargon and philosophy. I, and I and I read all that stuff and I enjoy it. But the, the focus on this book was like, here are actionable things you can try tomorrow that could be, you know, helpful for you in your home. What? Well and so I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> but I, I mean, I agree with you. The whole actionable thing is is super key when it comes to nonfiction. nonfiction. I, just, I don't have patience for nonfiction books that don't, you know, they they give this really complicated philosophy, which once again, it's, it's not about not understanding. It's just it, it right. kind of begs the question of what does that mean for me? Right. Like, all right, like, this is great. This is fancy. I can tell you're educated and I'm I'm proud of you for that. What does that mean for me? And I think right. that's the question that you're answering um, that a lot of people are missing. The other thing, and this is going to, I'm going to preface this next point with a question. So about how long is your book, if you don't mind me asking? So it is not long, which was actually a big fight with my publisher. It's like, oh. I, I had to look at it. I think like it ended up being like a hundred and, oh no, it's less than I thought, like 150 pages. It was long enough so that the spine could show the name <laughs> like that was the problem like and honestly that was it um so you know there's some graphics and stuff we put in there um because it, it just to me like I as a parent I wasn't picking up a big book that was important to me too well and, and that's exactly leads and I assumed it wasn't not because and it's not a reflection of you as an author but based on the way it sounds like you wrote the book I didn't anticipate it being very long, but I don't see a problem. Like I have read plenty of nonfiction books that are long, you know, for, for whatever reason, maybe the publisher demanded a word count. Maybe the author just likes to write a lot, but the problem with a lot of those books is they're very circuitous. Um, she's like, you're saying the same thing over and over and over. And I was like, I just read, in fact, I just gave one up. I won't talk about which book it is. I, I love the concept of the books, but the first 10 chapters were all kind of the same. I'm like, yeah, you know, you could have shrunk this. I don't know why you keep hitting the same point. You came up with about 15 different stories for the exact same point. And it's not helpful. I'm just, I, I want something else. And I think that's, you know, the where it, less is, can sometimes be more. Now, once again, I'm not an expert on nonfiction books, but I have read plenty of nonfiction books. And the ones that are pretty to the point, you know, they can have a lot of things and then lots of stories. They can hit the same point multiple times. But once you hit it about 10, 15 times, it's dead. Like, <laughs> stop yeah. talking about it. So I have no problems with your book being shorter. I think that's great. Um, mm -hmm. And it's practical for parents. You know, you you knew who your audience were. Yes, yes. I, I, right. And, you know, some of them will sit and read it like in one sitting because you can because it's short enough. Great. And then, like my favorite were like the pictures I got um, sent on Instagram of people saying, like, I keep this book in my glove compartment. And then every day I have five minutes in the pickup line. So I read four pages <laughs> like, great, you can do that. And that's uh, that's parenting. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you always get the time to digest a book in a different way. Um, so that's where the bullet points to me were important. So if you read like three pages, then you put it aside for three months, you could remember what you read <laughs> because mm -hmm. that is the modern parenting. No, yeah, that is absolutely totally key. So I want to, this is probably like not that exciting to talk about, but I am curious from a formatting perspective, yeah. what did you use to format, you know, with the images and the graphics and the, do you, is there a specific system that you use for that? Or did you pay someone to take care of that? So, you know, that's where like having a publisher was helpful. So sure. um, I, I literally just like gave them my words mm -hmm. and a document and then my graphics and I knew like I wanted each chapter to start with a quote from the chapter but sure. they made me look good which was really helpful um so they use you know software that I don't even know about um so that was <laughs> that was awesome and um and you know really nice to not have that responsibility so yeah, definitely people listening that as a pro for traditionally publishing. So I, I'm not an advocate for either type of publishing. I personally decided to self-publish. I have lots of reasons for that. 
But yeah. I do like to kind of pick out points, positive points of both. And yes, that is that is a positive point of traditionally publishing. A lot of that overhead work is not on you as an author, right. yeah. which is so nice. You know, I, I, I would love to, as a self publisher be able to be like, here are my words, make it pretty, oh. format it, and then, you know, get it back. Now, I do that all myself. So definitely a little bit of a con from self-publishing. Yeah. But, you know, you figure it out. You learn. Yeah. And you give up, like you give up choices too. Yeah, exactly. you know? Like I definitely had moments where I was like, Oh, like, is this what I should have done? Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, I don't know. We went back and forth about some of the formatting in the end. Like I had to let it go because mm-hmm. it's not a contract. Right. And they need to get the book out. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was an experience too, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, in the end it for sure. Uh, I've worked to my advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just love hearing these stories, you know, both the positive and the negative of both, because I think there's too much. I think there's too many authors out there. They may be seeking, hey, I, I want the absolutely perfect method. It's like, well, I hate to break it to you. There's not going to be a perfect method. There's going to be pains in both parts of publishing. And you just have to decide, hey, what's worth it for me? What works absolutely. for me? And, you know, I've networked with tons of authors through social media, which has been amazing. Um and, you know, I, I, I published my book with a very small publishing house, like an independent um, press, and I've connected with people who, you know, have been published through like imprints for Random House, like, you know, a major wow. player in the mm-hmm. publishing world. And some of our like complaints or frustrations are the same, right? Oh, so it's like, even if you get like that amazing deal with like the publisher, it is still hard work. There are still things that are pain points for all of us. I think that is very true. Mm-hmm. Well, becoming a best-selling or famous or rich author these days, it just looks different. Now, is it possible? Perhaps, but I, I think, yeah, it definitely requires a lot of work on everybody's part. And so don't come to it with with unrealistic expectations. Just remember why you're writing. I mean, it's clear you're passionate about parenting. It's clear you're passionate about your education, the things you've learned. And that comes out in your writing and people can tell that and the right readers will connect with that and they'll yeah. pass it on to other readers. And, you know, maybe a slow moving process, but you find your readers. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Patience is key and it's not easy. No, it's <laughs> definitely not. So if you could give us a little bit of a sneak peek about what your next book is about, you know, is it similar? Is it about parenting? Is it about something completely different? You know, where, where are you going with your writing? Yeah, it's actually, it's not about parenting, really. It's really more about me. Okay. Um, so, you know, this was my sort of how-to guide for parents. And I said, I you know, I found all these blogs and all these things I have started. And I really went to revisit them. And, um, you know, I found I, I, I had a story to tell about my journey through it of acceptance of who I was, you know, growing up with ADHD and anxiety, um, my professional journey. So it's, it's kind of the next, um, maybe in the series, I'm not so sure exactly, um, you know, of how I figure out how to, how to do life like me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, and it's, it's more personal. It's definitely like tons and tons of stories, um, and less emphasis, I think, on like actionable um, strategies and more of just, um, you know, I hope people will relate to it. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of memoir like, yeah, maybe yeah. not a full memoir, but then memoir like. Yes, yes, it is memoir like. So, you know, I, I, that will be different. So it'll be interesting. But, you know, my career has really taken, um, oh my God, so many twists and turns, but something that, um, I didn't expect it's happened the last couple of years is that I started to work with more and more adults. Hmm. I was always, with, you know, working with kids um, and more and more adults who have ADHD, who have anxiety, who are entrepreneurs and so on. Um, so that's really where it felt like the right um, topic to address. I, I you know, <laughs> I, I started about like six um, second books, but this is the one I <laughs> settled on. Um, and, you know, that's where I am now. <laughs> so, I love that. That's, that's, a, that's a true ADHD author right there. I started about eight different projects. <laughs> I didn't get too far into them, thank God. But, um, yes. you know, I had to take the parenting book and um, change it up to make it more of like a professional guide um, mm-hmm. for teachers. Like that's in the works maybe too. But, um, 
you know, every time I sort of went back to what do I want to write next, this was the one that popped up first in my mind. So again, I was like, okay, this is obviously like the story I feel I need to tell. So I'm going to do it. I love it. I think that's amazing. Coincidentally, this podcast is an ADHD project that's stuck. So here we are. It's a little bit ironic, but um, so I I love that though. And you know, you know, you know yourself, we've talked many times about how you know yourself. And so you know that that's stuck out. And I think there's a a lot of people there that stress too much about, you know, I'm doing too many projects. I'm letting things fall through the cracks. It happens. I mean, it's just stressing about it's not going to help. You know, yeah. are you doing the thing? Are you you keeping yourself alive and well for the most part? Are you keeping those you love and are responsible for alive and well? Then you're doing the right things and everything else. It's not a big deal if it falls through the cracks, in my opinion. Right. I, I, yep. yep. Either I'll come back around or it won't. Right. Exactly. And that's, yeah, some of it, like you just have to kind of trust that it will <laughs> the way oh, I totally agree with you. And I, I tell people that's how I write my books all the time. And they just, they just don't get it. You know, I don't take notes. I don't write things down. It's just my personality. And they say, well, what if you have a, an amazing idea while you're out and about and you don't write it down? I tell them if I remember it, then it's meant to go in the book. If I don't remember it, then <laughs> I'll come up with something else. Right, right. And that's, that's always what's happened. So more yeah. often than not, if I come up with a really good idea, it'll stick. And when I get to my writing session, that point, it'll be there. So yeah. I don't, I don't worry too much about that. I've got mm-hmm. other things to worry about. Um, <laughs> exactly. So I'd love to keep chatting about this. One of these times we'll have to have a, a completely different conversation about writing with ADHD because it is, yeah. it is a big beefy fun. topic. I'm mm-hmm. just existing with ADHD, yeah. but okay. we are running out of time. So where can people find more information about you and your books? Yeah. So my website is frankiebagdad.com. Easy to remember, but not easy to spell my name. Um, <laughs> so Frankie with an I, um, Baghdad, like Baghdad. And you can find there's a page on my book. Um, I always try to uh, highlight the local bookstores and independent mm-hmm. bookstores that are selling it. Um, and of course, like you can find in all the big retailers too. Um, and my blog, I have a Substack blog and I just started converting, um, my blogs to, um, well, not converting, they're still there, but also adding audio so people can nice. listen. Oh, cool. Um, I mean, that's like a way a lot of people are consuming mm-hmm. their information these days. No time to read, but time to listen. So that's been a fun project too. I've been listening to tons of audiobooks recently. So yeah. I do love to read, but audiobooks, podcasts, you know, right. they, they jive with me. But that's great so much. This has been a very helpful. Thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thank you. I hope you found that as interesting and helpful as I did. It was really great to hear someone else with the perspective of learning to cope with their ADHD, writing their first book, particularly from a non-organized manner and or, you know, without a lot of planning, <laughs> because that's generally how I um, go through my writing career. But, you know, there's just a lot of things out there that I think people are they feel too nervous to get started on writing, particularly because they may have a disability or um, they don't really know how to go about it. So it's great to hear these real stories and be encouraged by it. So this next week, we'll be talking to Janine Hamner about burnout, how to deal with it, how to prevent it, and what does that mean for you as an author? So I I think you'll really enjoy that conversation. Um, So if you enjoyed this, definitely share it with your friends and let me know if you'd like to join me on the podcast, dankenner.com slash podcast, or comment on any of the videos or the shows and i'd love to connect thank you so much talk to you next week Mm